Hi, I'm really excited to bring this Christ Revealed interview to you. Let's go ahead and jump in. So when uh, you talk about the old city and the old city walls, and you know, there's, there's a lot of history there, um, when, you, when people are new to the city that are Christians that are coming here to, to have the experience of Jerusalem, um, is there a specific order of things that you feel like they should be doing uh, to have the experience? I think it's very helpful to work chronologically when you come, if you're going to focus on the life of Jesus, mm -hmm. to go chronologically is very helpful um, because it, it takes you from origins, it puts you in the Jewish community, a community that was waiting for the Blessed Hope and recognized it, people like Simeon and Anna at the Temple Mount, mm -hmm. and then to walk through the Passion Week. Um, to visit places like the Pool of Siloam, mm -hmm. which is to me one of the most exciting excavations going on right now. Yes. The actual Pool of Siloam and the road that led up to the temple. Yeah. Amazing stuff, you know. You know, and, and to, to visit the Israel Museum, really important, and see how Second Temple Period Jerusalem looked because of the model. It gives you such an overview. And the Dead Sea Scrolls. To go to the wilderness and experience John the Baptist, mm -hmm. and the Essenes, and to understand that from the perspective of the New Testament, there's a prophetic move happening in that those centuries leading up to the time of Jesus that culminates with Jesus. So from the Essenes with their Dead Sea Scrolls to John the Baptist preaching the coming of the kingdom, both of them preaching a repentance from the heart and individual relationship with God, mm -hmm. and yet one has power in miracles, the Essenes, John the Baptist is a preacher, but he's not a healer. Mm -hmm. And then in Jesus, we find someone who takes the preaching of the kingdom, the personalness of God, individual responsibility and relationship. So the preaching of that good news coupled with power and miraculous ability. And he's willing to step outside into the public sphere and risk approaching all the marginal people all the people who are not players mm -hmm. in the religious status quo, women, Samaritans, you know, people who are uneducated, who are just the local people, and to talk to them about God in the language that they understand, mm. which is the language of his parables, yeah. shepherds with sheep and goats, fathers with their children, farmers with their seed. This isn't the language of the academy. This is the language that the everyday people know, and he opens out that hopeful message of God's mercy and love and the kingdom to everyday people. Yeah, I'm really glad you, you spoke to that because uh, nobody's really brought that to light as far as who he was speaking to, the audience, and sort of the varying classes, and that that was an unusual thing. It was a very unusual yeah. thing. And he, he reflects on that in his parables when, he's, when he says, you know, the kingdom of God is like a net cast into the sea that brings in good fish and bad fish both. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, at the end there will be this separation of these sheep and goats and then God will say, you know, you, were, you thought you were with me but you weren't actually with me because you didn't feed the hungry, clothe the naked, yeah. you know, preach the good news. He sees that there's risk and that in mixture, in opening this message, you're going to get a few wolves in sheep's clothing, yeah. but mostly you're going to get sheep. And, and he includes women as disciples, not just doing the laundry and cooking the meals, right. but sitting at his feet, learning and hearing from him, and being commissioned to go tell the apostles that he's written. Women had a very unusual role to play in, yeah. in Jesus' followers. And I guess that would be especially unusual, you know, being that he was Jewish, and again, given the context of the time that they were in, that, that he would include women in such a way. Yes, it, it's very unusual, and I, I think we have two things in, in the Gospels and the Acts that reflect on this. The first is that the early followers of Jesus, the writers of the Gospel, never hedged on the fact that it was women who were the first to the, to the tomb and who saw it empty and who received the message from the angels. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to perpetrate a hoax, you certainly wouldn't put, pick women as the witnesses right. because they weren't even allowed to give testimony in court. So the veracity of the account stands strong because they don't fudge on that ideal. Right. And the second thing is this very small note that we have in the Acts of the Apostles in Acts chapter 8 when Paul, Saul, at the time, he's mm -hmm. still a Pharisee and hasn't yet come to faith in Jesus, 
um, when Saul is persecuting, and this persecution is happening in the old city, which was just called Jerusalem. It wasn't called the old city then. Right. But they are going from house to house, and they're arresting the leaders of the house churches. Everybody meets in houses. There's no church buildings yet. Mm -hmm. And they arrest both men and women. They mm -hmm. arrest women also and throw them into prison. And this is a very a, unusual thing to have happen. Normally, you would arrest men. Like we see that the, apostles, the disciples all abandoned Jesus when he's crucified. They expect to be arrested. Right. The women are at the cross and they're watching. They're not expecting to be arrested. But as the movement gained momentum, women emerged in roles of leadership as well. So both men and women are arrested and thrown into prison because they both wield influence and authority in this early movement. It's fascinating to observe uh, and to bring to light. Our approach, you know, which uh, you know, you're speaking to really all three things uh, with Christ Revealed is the history, saying you mm -hmm. know, there's a historic record there, mm -hmm. the evidence, saying mm -hmm. what's the evidence that supports that history, and then the inspiration that emerges based on that history and evidence. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you start, we, we live in a very interesting time because of what evidence has emerged just in our lifetimes mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, right before our lifetimes as far as what we're seeing archaeologically, you know, et cetera, to validate uh, the veracity of, of, you know, what's written in the Bible. Uh, and then, you know, when, but when you're here, and I think this is what I want to ask you just from on a personal level, saying you got here, you thought you'd be here a year, and now it's been over three decades. Yes. What was the inspiration, you know, that, that brought that about? I, I always say that um, we came to study for a year, but we found our vocation. Yeah. I mean, we didn't intend to start a school, but all these resources that are here, from a scholarly vantage point, wonderful Christian scholars, wonderful Jewish scholars, if they're not here, they come here. Mm -hmm. And so Jerusalem serves as a hub, this kind of magnet pulling people together that leads to interconnectedness worldwide. It's a very powerful thing. Learning to live as a Gentile Christian in a Jewish society mm -hmm. actually helps you to identify with the early Gentile Christians and the issues that were so you know, important to them. How do you have a congregation of Christians from Jewish backgrounds and Gentile backgrounds, mm -hmm. and the Jews keep kosher, mm -hmm. And the Gentiles don't, and that's everybody's freedom, right. but you want to have a potluck dinner. <laughs> these are issues that Paul addresses in his epistles, and these are issues that you can live out here. <laughs> um, so that kind of thing, and, and the access to the archaeology, it just it doesn't ever grow old. There's always something more to learn, and my husband and I, both being teachers at heart, um, just felt that this was where we were supposed to be and where we were supposed to teach. He also is a Dead Sea Scroll editor, and um, we've had tremendous opportunities, both working with the scrolls mm -hmm. to see how they have helped illuminate the New Testament and the world of Jesus. Can you discuss that a little bit? Yeah, little bit? I mean, these are really fun. There are two, two primary examples that always come to mind. When we listen to the proclamation of the angel Gabriel, to Mary, so in Luke chapter one, and he's talking about the child who's to come, and he says he'll be called the son of the most high, he'll be called the son of God, etc. Scholarship used to say, oh, this is just bogus. I mean, somebody's putting these words into Gabriel's mouth because the conceptions of a Messiah who would be the son of God wasn't found at that time in any Jewish literature. Right. But when they found 4Q246, so that's, 4Q means cave number four at Qumran. Mm -hmm. 246 is the manuscript number. Uh -huh. they, call it, they used to call it the Son of God text, but now they call it the Aramaic Apocalypse, I think. Anyway, it says those exact same things. Now this, yeah. it says that he will be called the Son of God, he will be called the Son of the Most High, he will be called Great. Exactly the phrases that we find reflected in Gabriel's pronouncement. Mm -hmm. And the document itself though, 4Q246, is a Jewish document. Mm -hmm. It's not a Christian document. It existed, it was copied before the Christian era. So that meant that there was at least one group of Jews at the time, we call it the late Second Temple period, who believed that the Messiah would be somehow a divine figure as well. Mm -hmm. And that the, the Christians are not 
post facto making it up. Right. But they're reflecting actually a very specific line of Jewish thought from the time of Jesus and that these are truly Jewish concepts and not Gentile mythological inventions. Um, another one is the Pierced Messiah text, mm -hmm. which talks about a Messiah, a kingly, princely figure who would be put to death, very unusual and unexpected. The third text has to do with the question that John the Baptist sends to Jesus. Mm. So you remember, John the Baptist, all four Gospels spend a lot of time on John the Baptist because right. we always have to clarify, was Jesus a breakaway? Did he steal disciples? What's the relationship between these two? John the Baptist was a much more famous prophetic preacher in the first century than Jesus was. Right. John the Baptist had a bigger following all the way from Asia Minor to Egypt. Um, he, Josephus spends more time on John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. So what happens? John the Baptist is thrown in prison. Herod Antipas, who's the Herod of the Galilee, is going to put him to death and he knows he's going to die. And now he's facing an imminent death and he sits there and he says, did I get it wrong? What happened? I thought Jesus was the Messiah. What does John know? John knows that Jesus is up in the Galilee. Mm -hmm going from place to place, preaching good news, you know, healing people, praying for them, delivering them, but he's not doing what John and the other Jews of Jesus' day expected. They expected the Messiah to go down to Jerusalem and overthrow the Romans mm -hmm. and restore Jewish independence. So now he says, did I get it wrong? And he sends his disciples to Jesus and he says, ask him. So they ask, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? That's the question right. of chapter, chapter seven. And so Luke says, at that time, Jesus did many things. He healed the sick, he gave sight to the blind, he gave hearing to the deaf, the lame walked, and he raised the dead. Mm -hmm. Okay, now he raised the dead was the problem because scholarship said, okay, this is not correct. Nobody expected the Messiah to raise the dead. Mm -hmm. Jesus clearly you know, didn't do that or people were just creating these fictions until they found 4Q521. Mm -hmm. <laughs> K4 Qumran, manuscript number 521, Messianic Apocalypse, mm -hmm. in which it lists the things, the very deeds that the Messiah is gonna do. Same list, blind see, lame walk, deaf hear, and the dead are raised. Wow. And it's exactly the expectation and the answer that Jesus gives to John the Baptist. Until 4Q521 was found, it was thought that the only expectation for resurrection among Jews was gonna be at the end of time. Right. But in the words of Jesus and in this document, we see this expectation brought forward to the present. So he says to the disciples of John the Baptist, now go back and tell him what you have seen and blessed is he who does not take any offense in me. What does that answer mean? Hmm. He is saying to John, remember what the prophetic words say about the Messiah, what Isaiah says about the day of the Lord, what he says about the coming of God's goodness. It's not political. Hmm. It has to do with Jesus' own vision and mission statement, to care for those who are in need, to bring the good news to those who are oppressed, to set at liberty the captives to clothe the naked, feed the hungry, heal people's diseases. That is the sign of the Messiah, not overthrowing the Romans. Thanks so much for joining us for this interview, for taking this Christ Revealed journey with us. Remember, if you haven't already, subscribe. That way you'll get notified about all the new content that's coming down the road. Comment. People want to hear from you, and then maybe you'll encourage somebody else to make a comment. If you did like it, like it so other people know that it's something good for them to watch. And finally, share this. Send links to other people that you know and care about. Cost you nothing but maybe a few seconds of your time, but it might have a massive impact on their life. Anyway, really excited to be able to share this information with you. Thanks for tuning in.